In life and in nature, there are certain laws that we all have to live by. Gravity pulls smaller objects towards larger objects. Objects in motion tend to stay in motion. And if you have bad data, any model that you make is going to be bad too. So keep watching and we'll discuss this. I'm Richard and this is Richard on Data. All right, so one of the worst things ever is when you train some linear or machine learning model on a training set, then you go in to see how it performs, and it's just awful. For a lot of people, your first instinct is going to be to try to change the hyperparameters. Maybe use a neural network model instead of a random forest model, something along those lines. But quite frankly, most of the time, the issue has nothing to do with the model that you're using and everything to do with the data itself. So I'm gonna detail six different scenarios that can occur, and I'm gonna explain how each of these individual situations can possibly affect the quality of your model. And I'll also have some links in the description to some supplemental perspectives out there from the big data science blogs, which go into more detail on each of these topics. I'm also going to detail these issues within the framework of two possible outcomes, and those are inference and prediction. If you're unfamiliar with the difference between those terms, I'll have a card up above to a video I've done on this, and a link will be in the description for that as well. Before we get started, please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and also take less than one second of your time to smash the like button because that really does help my content reach a larger audience. I also have a link in the description of this video to my Patreon account, so if you guys would be willing to support me in that way, it would be enormously appreciated. The first scenario is when you just don't have enough data. Now, most people in statistics intuitively understand that if you have a higher sample size, you're going to have a more powerful test. Well, the reverse of that is true too. If you have a low sample size, your test is not going to be as powerful. Suppose you're building a regression model and it's your job to infer which features are significant. Well, if you have too low of a sample size, you're going to run into a higher type two error rate. That is, you're gonna have a higher chance of falsely concluding that certain features aren't significant when truthfully they are. What's going on is that as sample size increases, the variance associated with your slope parameter estimate is going to decrease. So putting that another way, if we have a low sample size, you're going to have a higher variance of your slope parameter estimates in your regression model, and that is not what we want. And speaking more generally here, especially if you have way too many covariates in your model, having a low sample size makes it a lot more likely that you're going to overfit. Obviously, the whole purpose of most machine learning exercises is to learn patterns of your data based on a training set so that when new data is introduced, you can generalize to that new data and make accurate predictions. And you're just way more likely to overfit your model when it's learning these patterns based on only a few observations. So if possible, get more data. And if that's not an option, understand what you can and can't do and how that low sample size limits your capabilities. The second issue that can occur is when you have covariates that don't really have a lot of variation in them. Let me give you a few examples. This one might be a little bit counterintuitive, but if you have a continuous variable that has really low variance, that's not necessarily a good thing. If you're using a regression model, the lower the variance is for that variable, the higher the variance of the estimate of that slope parameter is going to be. And that is the opposite of what you want, again. Another possible scenario is that you have a categorical variable that has tons of levels. And naturally, some of these levels are going to occur more frequently than others. Some might occur only 10% of the time. Who knows, some of them may even occur less than 1% of the time you're gonna have the same problem. The model is going to overfit. Coming back to the regression example again here, you're going to have obnoxiously high variance for the slope parameter estimates associated with those levels that don't occur very frequently. Now this one you kind of have to handle on a case-by-case -case basis depending on the data and depending on the scenario. You might be able to get away with collapsing infrequently occurring levels into some other one category, let's call it other, but you might have to be a little careful with that because practically speaking, those infrequently occurring levels might represent some things that are dramatically different. 
One thing that you could do is look at the distribution of the response variable for these different infrequently occurring levels. And if that looks pretty similar, I might feel more comfortable merging them together. But broadly speaking, there is a lot of discussion to be had on how to encode different levels of factors, so much so that I could probably fill a whole video with it. But for now, I'll have a link in the description of this video to a good Medium article that talks about this. Number three is sort of the opposite of the last one. You can have too much variation in your data, or more specifically, you can have outliers in certain features. Now again, particularly if your sample size isn't great, this puts you at risk of overfitting the model. So from a practical standpoint, outliers should cause you to ask some questions about how reliable the data actually are. It could have been for that particular observation, as far as the business process for how that data got generated, something that time was screwed up or unstable. And if that's the case, there might be a case to be made for eliminating that row altogether, or at least getting rid of that outlier and just making it an NA. But suppose your data set is completely legitimate, and yes, there are outliers in certain variables and you just have to live with them. Now, certain models are more and less sensitive to outliers than others, but even doing simple things like normalizing your variables can make a huge difference. Another option is what's called Windsorizing the outliers. Now, there's no hard and fast rule on this one, but it's an interesting problem that you'll have to address on a case-by-case -case basis. And I'll have two links in the description just detailing some of the relative advantages and disadvantages of Windsorizing the outliers versus just trimming them out. Number four on this list should come as no surprise to anybody, and that's having useless, uninformative variables in your model. From the standpoint of inference, let's come back to the regression model example. And let's suppose you knew in advance exactly which features are completely useless. Well then, in that situation, it wouldn't make any sense to include these in your model now, would it? Like from a worst case scenario, you might conclude that some of these are significant, that is, you make a type 1 error by chance alone. The problem is, it can be a bit of a catch-22, because most of the time when you're doing a regression analysis, the whole purpose is to separate out which variables are meaningful and which variables are meaningless. And that's where the consulting side of data science and the domain knowledge can really help out. Maybe you can take some preliminary regression analysis results to a stakeholder and let them chime in and figure out which parts of it make sense and which don't. Ideally, before you even begin such an analysis, you'll have some good kind of preliminary idea of which data to include and which not to include. And again, that's probably going to be informed by the domain knowledge rather than the statistical expertise. And the story is similar for prediction. Again, if you have a lot of junk going into your model, you're probably going to end up with a model that overfits. Now again, you can get rid of uninformative variables by using your domain knowledge, or you can get rid of them through regularization or feature selection techniques. Now there's one more specific case of uninformative variables being included in the data set to talk about, and that's multicollinearity. That's going to be number five on this list. Most people with some statistics knowledge have at least some basic understanding of this. It's the situation when your covariates have some correlation with each other. And the rules for this, again, are not hard and fast, but it's generally a good rule of thumb that if a feature has a variance inflation factor of greater than 5, or certainly greater than 10, then you need to do something about it, because that feature is producing multicollinearity. And depending on your objective, there are a few different approaches you could take next. You could drop out some of the covariates with the high variance inflation factor, or maybe you can just use principal component analysis. In the regression context, a variable that has a high variance inflation factor is going to be bad news, because that increases the variance of the slope parameter estimate. Similarly, let's say you're using a random forest model to use the feature ranking for inference purposes. That feature ranking is going to be unreliable if you have multicollinearity. I'll have a link in the description to a paper which describes this topic in greater detail. Now to be fair, the picture is a little bit less clear for multicollinearity when the goal is prediction, because for a lot of different models, multicollinearity isn't necessarily going to be a big issue or cause you a lot of problems but it's certainly not gonna help either. Now, everything that I've talked about in this list so far pertains to the predictors. 
But the last item on this list is the situation where you have some kind of outcome variable, but that outcome variable is poorly trained for some reason or just generally does not reflect reality. Let me give you a personal example for this one. So several years ago, I was tasked with building a predictive model that predicted the onset of a certain medical condition. Well, we didn't have the outcome variable defined for that. We didn't have labels for medical condition, yes or no, so we had to use clinical feedback to create a proxy for that outcome variable. It should be pretty self-explanatory that regardless of your goals, if your outcome variable does not represent reality, there is absolutely nothing that can work well. Even if you build a model that can perfectly predict that outcome, which I guarantee you, you won't, it's meaningless because you're ultimately predicting something that doesn't really mean a whole lot. Similarly, you could be inferring that some feature that you have strongly influences that meaningless outcome variable you've created. Again, that's not something that's gonna do anybody any good. In the personal example that I gave, having that proxy outcome variable be as accurate as possible and as closely reflect the reality on the ground as possible was gonna be way more important than any machine learning model that I could throw at the problem, or probably more so even than any of the other data issues I've talked about so far in this video. And you'd be surprised how common it is to see real-world problems like that, even if they're maybe not as extreme as the example that I gave. If you're not 100% sure that your outcome variable is reliable, focus on getting it to be as reliable as possible. So hopefully now that we've gone through these six items, you have a pretty solid idea of why it's most important to focus on the data rather than the model creation itself. Keep in mind, this list isn't totally comprehensive. There are other problems that can arise out there, and particularly if your job involves being on the ground collecting and measuring the data that you're eventually gonna use for modeling, that opens up an entire new layer of potential data issues that can possibly occur. But if you understand exactly how bad data can influence a model and you focus your efforts on the right places, you're going to be both an efficient and an effective data scientist. So thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it or you found it of value, please consider sharing this video as well as, again, smashing the like button. And also leave me a comment down below and let me know the scenarios in which you've personally run into bad data yourself. Then I'll see you all in the not so distant future. Until then, Richard on data.